Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Between Tides podcast presented by Portage Learning. I'm Allison Agnew, and I'm here with my co-host, Michelle Cooper. Say hello, Michelle. Hello. And we're very excited to be here today because we have a special guest who's going to help us do a little deep dive into maybe some history that we never learned in school. Um, This is Dr. Jeffrey Cole, and he is a Portage professor as well as a Geneva professor. Dr. Cole did his undergraduate and master's degrees at Lynchburg College and received his doctorate from Bowling Green State University. And he knows a lot about history. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're very kind. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't said you know a lot of good stuff about history. (laughs) You know, there's always more to learn about history. That's that's one of the fun things about it. So absolutely. Yeah. I guess kind of to start and kind of a little bit going off of that, um, what can you tell us? Or I guess I worded that weird. Um, can you tell us what you love learning about history? Ah, uh, sure. I think because there's always something else to know. There's it, it, take World War II for example. It's one of the areas that I teach, and uh, you can study the history of World War II from America's perspective. You can study mm. it from Britain's perspective or whatever country, and then you start to peel away the layers, and you're like, oh, there's this interesting story and that interesting story, and there's this person and that person. So it's I would say it's endlessly fascinating. That's mm. really cool. Yeah. Um, Do you have a favorite historic period, country, era, or maybe just one of those times that's a little bit juicier than it might seem if you just like learn about it in (laughs) school? Juicy is what we want. (laughs) Juicy is what you want. Juicy, I'll try to give you. Uh, What's my favorite period? Um, I'm a historian of 20th century American history where most of my training was. And so I think probably World War I to World War II is my Mm. favorite era. And I wrote my dissertation on the Great Depression and New Deal. Mm. Uh, but I just, I don't know, there's something about uh, wartime that really fascinates me. It's because of the way people um, respond to adversity yeah. and uh, the way the human spirit really rises, tries to rise above um, adversity, evil, and, and do good yeah. and, and accomplish um, great things during very, under very trying circumstances. Yeah. What were you thinking of when you said that? Like, um, I guess... When I think about history and I think about like really big things happening, I think about the evil or like the bad things that were happening. But what good things would you say happened? Mm. Um, I, I would say that there's there's always this opportunity to see the good. And I try to see the good. Uh, for example, you know, we look at the Great Depression and uh, we see the the horrible things that happened to people. But mm-hmm. yet one of the areas I study is um, the stories of people who traveled around looking for work during the Great Depression, and you see how people helped one another, and you see how organizations tried to um, help people survive. And mm-hmm. you see from a from a federal level how Franklin Roosevelt and his administration really cared for the American people and tried to do what was right by them. So I think it's that sort of thing that interests me especially. So yeah, there's the good, and there's the evil, and you put them together, and you have this holistic story, a realistic story of human life. Mm-hmm. I often think that you can look back through history and see how one period really led to the next big thing that happened. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about the 1930s, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl years. But when we think about the decade before, we think it was a decade of excess and Mm -hmm. partying and (laughs) prohibition and speakeasies. So I've always thought of the 20s. I've learned about the 20s as the roaring 20s. Is that true? Is that an accurate representation? Um, In some ways it was, but it was a very conservative decade as well. So Mm. here's the thing about history. We want to remember and we want to know about the really interesting stuff, the Mm. unusual stuff. But often there's so much of of history and life and culture that's just normal. That's not very interesting. And so we kind of forget about that part because traditional is boring most Mm. of the time. But when we look back at the 1920s, especially, we have this tension between kind of the excitement that we know about the Mm -hmm. flappers Mm -hmm. and bathtub gin and, you know, jazz music and all that kind of stuff, which is true. But that was only a small sliver of the reality of America during the 1920s. So what are some of the stories from the 1920s that maybe weren't so roaring that we certainly didn't learn from our textbooks or our teachers in school. Sure. Well, it was uh, a very racist time Mm. in American history. Uh, One of the reasons for that, you 
uh, was because of uh, the the significant immigration that had occurred between beginning about 1880 and going through 1924. And about uh, 23 million people came into the United States in that period of time. And and in the latter decades leading up to World War I, uh, there were about a million people a year that were coming into the United States wow. from Asia. They were coming from Western Europe, from Eastern Europe especially. And um, Americans reacted very negatively toward that because they felt that kind of uh, these people couldn't be... Um, they, they couldn't be part of the American story. You know, mm -hmm. America was changing in ways that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants really didn't like a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And so there's this backlash of, of things, of, of people's reaction, the responses to all of this. For example, we see a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan during the 19-teens and the 1920s, mm -hmm. not in the South, but in the North, actually, really? in, in Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, places like that, because it was, a, in, in, in large part, a response to um, the fact that many Catholics had come into the United States, many Jews had come into the United States, Black mm -hmm. people had migrated from the South to the North. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of people coming in from Mexico uh, to fill jobs and all that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. so um, there was this white people were feeling put upon. And mm -hmm. so uh, that was one of the responses to yeah. it. And uh, another part of that was there was a book that was published in 1960 by a man named Madison Grant. It was called The Passing of the Great Race. And what he argued was that um, this, this whole idea of the melting pot in America was something that was um, uh, just a fallacy, that it could never happen. Uh, one person said that immigrants were indigestible lumps in the national stomach, that it yeah. could never it, that could never happen. So Even, and it shouldn't. And they said, you know, the, the Nordic peoples, he called them Nordic peoples came and, you know, they founded this place as a as a place where everyone would be welcome. And he said, you know, that's that's actually they were wrong about that. Mm -hmm. that. That can't be. And so he said, you know, America can't be this place of all these different people living together because um, what we're after is, and this was a phrase taken from the from World War One, one hundred percent Americanism, um, hmm. and that was something that you know was a rallying cry for many people. So wow. it was extremely racist in that sense, and then of course also um, racism toward Black people mm -hmm. uh, during the nineteen twenties. Lynchings uh, were uh, there were a significant amount of lynchings uh, yeah. during the nineteen teens and the nineteen twenties as well, um, and so the, just. That in general is one indication of how traditional America was. There were um, uh, um, immigration restrictions that were passed, 1917, a Literacy Act, uh, 1921, mm -hmm. 1924. Uh, to keep people out of the United States. So the Literacy Act of 1917 was interesting because um, it said that anyone who comes into the United States that is 16 years or older, accepting elderly people, had to be able to read and write a language of their choice. Because the theory was, if you can read and write, then, you know, you're, you're, a decent person. You're valuable. You're valuable, right, exactly. Sure. And so we want you here, or at least, you know, we don't want people who aren't literate here. Yeah. Um, the, in 1924, the National Origins Act cut back by 80% the number of people that had been allowed in the United States 10 years earlier in 1914. So it was pretty significant. Just by having that That's ordinance crazy. in place? Yep. yep. So the, the question that comes to my mind is you arrive on a boat you take a test, you fail the test, what happens to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, sometimes you were sent back. Actually, when you arrived at someplace like Ellis Island, for mm -hmm. example, uh, you were examined and uh, you were asked questions mm -hmm. like, um, you know, are you an anarchist? Are you a communist? Mm -hmm. uh, because communism, that's another story altogether. Yeah. Um, you know, what are, what are your views about marriage? Are you a polygamist? And all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And uh, theoretically, you could be sent back. You were also examined for your physical condition as sure. well um, because they didn't want people with diseases coming yeah. into the United States. So yeah, theoretically, you could be sent back. Wow. That's just crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. Were there people who were like, okay, I know I have to be sent back, but I'm not going. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there were people who were dragging their feet at, what, at one point. Uh, in the early 1920s, uh, after there was there was a Red Scare early in the 1920s, another example of kind of uh, conservatism at work. Uh, there was like 200 and some people who were put on a boat 
and sent uh, to the Soviet Union uh, by the, I think it was the mid 1920s actually, and it, on what they called the Soviet Ark because these people were communists and we didn't want them here. So it was that wow. it was that sort of thing that, uh, you know, it's, it's extremely traditional. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's all underneath the surface. I mean, you look at somebody like uh, Henry Ford. I love to talk about Henry Ford because people know about him. His yeah, legacy sure. is still with us today. Right, we're all driving around cars Fords, right? you know, that or were made in factories that he helped design. So, exactly. Great you know, guy, right? Well, <laughs> uh, he was, he's an interesting person because I, I like to say he had his wallet in one time and his heart in another time. Mm. And uh, because his, his car was changed, the Model T changed the United States technology. He, right. he uh, invented and perfected the assembly line. A lot of people think he invented the automobile. He didn't, uh, but he perfected the assembly line by 1925. Uh, a Ford automobile was was rolling off the assembly line every 10 seconds. And That's I mean, so, crazy. yeah, it's crazy. And the profits of the Ford Motor Company were just tremendous. Uh, but he was also, he wanted to preserve America. He wanted to preserve the America that he remembered from his childhood growing up on a farm. And so uh, during the 1920s, one of the things that he did was he he hated jazz music. He thought that jazz music was corrupting. Uh, and, you know, jazz was extremely uh, popular at the time. You mentioned sure, Allison, uh, jazz music previously. And, um, you know, here were these, you, you saw pictures of these kids dancing. You know, you couldn't like put a piece of paper between them. And this was like, this was very scandalous. Yes. Yes. Right. And parents were seeing this and they're like, you know, if that's going on on the dance floor, what's going on in the cars? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, by the way, it's funny because um, the automobile was sometimes called the brothel on wheels because you never knew. <laughs> What, yeah, you never knew <laughs> what kids were doing in the backseat of the car because oh what, as the automobile developed, uh, they be, the automobile became enclosed. Mm -hmm. And so this was a way for kids to get away from their parents sure. and, um, you know, do whatever. Uh, but anyway, Henry Ford hated jazz music. He hated the dancing that went along with it, the way that right. America was changing in that way. So uh, he brought actually uh, square dance instructors to Dearborn, Michigan. And then he brought people in to learn from them to teach, to go back to their communities and teach square dancing. And a lot of times they would hold these uh, square dance lessons in Ford Motor Company showrooms wow. so that people could learn this traditional dancing and get away from this, uh, you know, jazz and all that sort of thing. But Henry Ford was um, also extremely anti-Semitic mm -hmm. as well. Um, he, he had a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. And because um, Ford Motor Company was uh, centered in Dearborn, Michigan. Mm. And um, it was, he, he had these investigators that went out and dug up dirt on Jewish people. Mm. And um, he published all of this. And um, actually Hitler got a hold of Henry Ford's writings. And at one point uh, when, after he had come to power, um, Hitler said, I regard uh, Henry Ford as my inspiration. Oh which is really interesting. So oh, you want to talk no. about conservatism. Yeah. And actually Henry Ford was the only American, is the only American mentioned in um, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, my struggle that he wrote in the 1920s while he was in prison. Hmm. And um, Henry Ford is the only American to receive the highest uh, award that the Nazi government could, uh, could bestow. All right, um, a quick well. question. Yeah. He gets an award from Nazi Germany. Does he go to Germany to yeah. accept the no, award? No, he didn't. He it was presented to him in the United States. He never met Hitler. He and Hitler okay. never met. Um, he, which is I'm sure that was a great sorrow for them both. Well, well yeah. What were his yeah. thoughts on it? Was he like, all right, Hitler likes me, or was it like, oh gosh, I'm really going down a bad path? I don't think he felt that way because I think that um, really he he was very anti-Semitic um, and uh, we actually we he may have contributed to the Nazi Party. Oh, like, like funds mm -hmm. there, but there's been no, there's no paper trail, but it would not, it would not surprise historians if that was, hmm. if that had been the case. Well, I'm floored. Um, so, yeah. and, and here's the thing. Remember that Henry Ford um, created the Model T as a car for the masses. This was mm -hmm. to be a car that anyone, he said, anyone who's working should be able to afford a Model T. Hitler takes that idea and creates the Volkswagen, huh? Volks meaning people the people's car the people's and car. um and that's that was sort of his inspiration for the volkswagen was the model t i picked as well. the wrong language on so Duolingo. <laughs> that's sort of a that's sort of a um a roundabout way of saying here's here's a person that's really indicative of the of the struggle between yeah. traditionalism 
and and uh, sort of moving forward in American society because his car was changing American society in many ways, changing the morality of youth. Some would say it was, you know, he was behind this with the, you know, youth being able to go wherever they wanted. Yeah. Uh, but that traditionalism also, again, of the racism that we see yeah. from Henry Ford um, as well. And I think about unintended consequences. I remember reading a long time ago that the invention of the bicycle changed rural England because it actually um, allowed um, young adults to go and meet people from other villages. Mm. And it mm. actually decreased in, inbreeding and incest and things of that nature because they could That's actually true. get out of their village and meet other people, marry mm. from outside mm-hmm. of their village. Mm. And not to hold up Henry Ford in any way, but the car did that too for many people. It just allowed the common man to have this way of seeing more of the world, of getting out of their community, of experiencing other places and other things. Mm-hmm. So it is interesting that it seems like nothing, we're, we're never in a vacuum in history. And so mm-hmm. we look at, you know, you can go back to Rome and look at the persecution of, you know, the early Christians that allowed, you know, Christianity to spread out of the known world at that time. And even in Germany, you know, as as horrible as what the Nazis did, and it was absolutely horrible. The unintended consequence of that is that we had so many Jews flee to places like America, and we were enriched by the things that they brought with them, even though they should never have had to flee. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting to look at the threads of history that they connect so um, so well together in ways you could never imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, historical events don't come out of nothing, sure. right? There's what we call precipitating events, and that's the spark that you know kind of lights lights the fire or causes a big event to happen. But there are also long term causes mm-hmm. as well. And then, as you're saying, there are ramifications of historical events too. It's like dropping a pebble in a puddle, and you see the the ripple effects yeah. of that. And yeah, we certainly we certainly do see that throughout history. Sure. And um, you know, I, I just, there is so much in the 1920s, sort of the World War I to, to uh, 1929 period that is, I mean, so relevant to us today. Um, and, I, you know, I, we were talking about um, the sort of the conservatism of the 1920s. One of the things I always love to point to is the, uh, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Oh, of, interesting. Uh, okay. Of 1925, because think about the fact that this is, that happened in a, it could not have happened without um, extreme conservatism in Tennessee, passing a law that says that anyone who teaches evolution, you know, oh. is going to be fined for that. I think up to $500 fine for that. So that's the Scopes Monkey trial said, uh, the it legis- state legislature of Tennessee said anybody who teaches uh, evolution can be uh, fined for that. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. So here's what happened. Um they knew that this was going to be challenged. And so there was this uh, New York businessman who had gone to a little town called Dayton, Tennessee. And um, Dayton, Tennessee had been, it, was, it wasn't it was an old town, but it had been uh, sort of uh, flourished for a while because of the railroads. Well, time kind of left by the 1920s, time had left Dayton, Tennessee behind. And so this New York businessman said, what can we do to kind of bring more attention to Dayton, Tennessee. Well, this law was passed in Tennessee, this anti-evolution, teaching evolution law. And so this businessman got together with the president of the school board and a couple other people and said, hey, why don't we challenge this law and we'll bring attention to Dayton, Tennessee? So it wasn't anything that was necessarily ideological, right? right? They weren't was, passionate about it. No, no, <laughs> they wanted to bring they were attention to Tennessee. And so to Dayton, Tennessee. And so, uh, long story short, they bring this this kid, twenty four year old John T. Scopes, into the into the a local drugstore, which was owned by the president of the school board, and they sit him down. They got him off the tennis court, and this during this you know during the summer, and they said, "Hey, would you be willing to say that you taught um, evolution?" And he had never taught evolution, but he said, yeah, sure, I'll say it. They didn't want to ask the biology teacher to do this because the biology biology teacher was also the high school principal and he had a family. Mm. And so they thought this could ruin his life, right? Just um, and so John T. Oh, Scopes. nice to know they had some scruples. <laughs> <laughs> so John T. Scopes says, yeah, I'll do it. So this, this, the... Um, Wait, I'm so sorry. What's going on in Scruple's life that like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just throw Tennyson my whole life away. 
<laughs> Do we have um, any beans on him? So all of this attention then focused on Dayton, Tennessee, because this crime was prosecuted. Uh, John T. Scopes admitted that he taught biology, uh, taught um, uh, evolution. evolution in biology. And there were students who said, yeah, he, he did. And um, so, yeah, I know it's all so made up. But there was this, it was like a huge carnival surrounding this as well. And so there oh, were, dear. it was like uh, this, this, a lot of attention came to Dayton, Tennessee. The, the media came from across the country and around the world. And there were planes that they cleared a field so that they could fly planes in oh and out gosh. every day with the That's with the footage crazy. and fly it to major cities in the United States so it could be, you know, disseminated by the media and all that sort of thing. Wow. Um, but that's this happened in a very conservative environment mm. in the night in the 1920s in the United States. So I think that's just another example uh, when I think about religious fundamentalism, especially uh, during the 1920s. I think about that. There was a writer named H.L. Mencken uh, mm. out of Baltimore. He was a uh, he wrote in the American Mercury, and he was this great uh, cultural critic. And he said the comment he made was something like, if you heave um, was a tomato or something. If you heave a tomato out of the window of a Pullman anywhere in America, you'll hit a fundamentalist. Um, so <laughs> he was like, yeah, they're all over the place. And which was, which was true. I mean, you see this too in the reaction to women's uh, style of clothing as well. Because, you know, when you think of the 1920s, we often think of flappers, right? Sure. I think you, Allison, you mentioned the flappers. The hemlines early. got shorter. And Absolutely. The... I mean, it was scandalous when <laughs> yes. hemlines got like six, nine inches above oh. the ankle. Well, in, got I think it was in Virginia and I want to say Ohio as well. Uh, they passed or tried to pass laws that said that um, a woman could not show more than two or three inches of her neck. Um, in, Cover up, Michelle. I know, I know. Yeah. Pull that shirt up. Michelle. Yeah. Know. <laughs> Scandalous. Um, Sorry, but <laughs> yeah, by the time the 20s were over, the skirts were up knee length, basically. Yeah. And women were, you know, they they were they tried to be thin, they bound their chests, they mm -hmm. cut their hair, they bobbed their hair, they were wearing makeup. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was very scandalous as well. They were smoking. Um, and so that's kind of the more liberal side of the, you know, mm -hmm. hey, party, party, party side of the of the decade um, yeah. as well. So um I think it's interesting because there if you uh remember uh, the history of the Constitution a little bit, you remember that the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote in okay. uh, 1919. I always get that wrong, but I think that's, yeah, in 1920. Uh, it's 19th Amendment in 1920. And so the backlash against that, and actually the fight against that was... Um, came out of this very conservative America. It's amazing that this was passed, by the way, when it was. But I think it was more of a, a reaction to what women had been working for for about, I don't know, 80, 90 years or so. A long time, yeah. But anyway, one of the arguments, some of the arguments against giving women the right to vote were very conservative. It's like, well, they're just going to they're just gonna vote the way their husbands tell them to vote. And you know right. that women are very emotional. Right. And so when they get into the voting booth, they're just going to fall apart mm. because they're not going to know mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. And actually, that that argument also was used to um, by opponents of women learning or women having licenses to drive yes. as well, because if women drive, you never know what they're going to do on the road. So, to be fair, yeah. no, I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> so these were, I mean, this this is just a very conservative traditional mindset mm -hmm. of of the 1920s that we see over and over again. I think during the during the decade. It's always interesting to me, and I'm, I'm as guilty of, of it as anyone else, we hate change. Yeah. And we feel threatened by something that might change our status quo. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. People wanted things to feel safe and feel as they always had been. And I even look at the age that I am now, and I think I look at my adult children and think, well, they should have grown up when I grew up because then they would do things the way that we did them. Mm. And I have to stop and think, why is that true? Why was the way that we did them better? It's just mm. different sometimes. And different can be negligible, or it can be good, or it can be bad, but different in and of itself. Sure. Yeah, there's always this, I think you're right. I think there's always this desire to at least moderate change. Yeah. Um, but there are some people who really push back against change as well. And we see that in many periods of history, but we see it today as mm -hmm. well in many ways without getting into politics, which I won't do. Um, but, you know, we see 
we see that because you're right. People are afraid of change. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes change isn't good. Right. right. I mean, I don't, I'm not sitting here saying, hey, change is always great. Sure. It isn't always great. But there's, there's this idea that, uh, at least in the 1920s, that people, people had this idea that they wanted America to move ahead where technology especially was concerned, but to hold on to the past, to hold on to what they remember, like Henry Ford, what he remembered about growing up in mm -hmm. rural America. And that was being, in his mind, being taken away by immigrants, by the growth of factories, by his own automobile. By his own, yeah, no. I was going to say. He... So, uh, yeah, yeah. I have two questions. Well, I don't know if they're really questions. Well, okay, yeah, the first one is a question. So going back to the scope I don't know his first name. The scope. John T. Scopes. Yes, yeah. him. How did we hear about that story? Like, how do we know he was just at a tennis court? And like, not just him. How do we hear about these one-off weird little stories that happen like that? Because yeah. like, I don't know. I always go back to the telephone example. Like, if it was passed down, how true is it? Sure. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So Yeah, that's a great question. And, and this is where historians are always careful. Like, it's... So I teach at college. And uh, inevitably, I'll have students... There's always a student who raises their hand and says, in high school, my teacher told me this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> well, you never know anymore, what they're going to come out with. And I'm <laughs> right. like, I don't know if that's true or not. Let me look mm -hmm. it up. Uh, but there are people who dedicate their lives to studying obscure things. What you might, you know, I remember coming across like the history of the New England clam bake once. You know, there are people who spend their time researching documents, interviewing people. Oh, wow. So it's, you know, as part of the historical process is documenting. So it's not just, hey, I heard from somebody, sure. but going to the archives, talking to people and 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 double checking, triple checking sources as well. Uh, so yeah, there was a book that was written um, in the last couple of decades about the, the Scopes trial. It's like, here's really what happened in Dayton, mm -hmm. Tennessee, which I didn't know about until I read the book. And it was really fascinating. Yeah. And then the other thing that I wanted to ask you was... Um... Do you think that if Henry Ford's intention was a little bit different, things would have been different? Like that's such a, I guess like maybe the Holocaust still would have happened or like genocide in Germany still would have happened. But if Henry Ford wasn't anti-Semitic, how much do you think would be different right now? About yeah, the past. That's, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm, I don't want to come off as blaming Henry Ford for the Holocaust or anything like that. Anti-Semitism was deeply rooted in European history. Um, oh, I didn't know deeply that. Deeply rooted, hundreds. You go. Actually, it goes back to the crucifixion of Christ because mm -hmm. uh, Christians blame Jews. They said you crucified Christ, and so then that that kind of blossoms into um, anti-Semitism and, and things like um, Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare we, we certainly. See it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, the stories about. Um, Jews using Christian babies in blood rituals and all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, and Jews kind of this plot of Jews to take over the world and all that. And, but it really came to a crescendo after World War I because Hitler went around saying, Jews stabbed Germany in the back with the Treaty of Versailles. They undermined you know, um, Germany because of the way that they, you know, they were behind uh, ruining Germany uh, in the Treaty of Versailles and making Germany pay reparations and taking territory away from Germany after World War I. So he really increased that rhetoric, but it had already been there. Sure. So this is, Michelle, that's my, that was kind of my earlier point too. Like this sort of thing doesn't come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hitler was persuasive, but he wasn't that persuasive. What he was doing was he was building on what people already knew and what they believed to be true about Jews. Yeah. Now, could he have convinced people of this? Yeah, probably. But he didn't have to do as hard. His work wasn't as difficult because of what they already believed. Yeah. And so that's there's this long hundreds and hundreds of years mm -hmm. of history of anti-Semitism in Europe. Okay. Do you think I'm going to reword my question? Do you think if Henry Ford had the opposite view, then if he was like, maybe not pro-Jewish people, but if, if he was like um, like a very loving person, and if he was part of his mission in making cars and doing what he had to do with Ford, if part of that was to spread as much love as he was able to, do you think that would change anything? Hmm. It's like the butterfly effect almost. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because historians try not to engage in speculative history. Really? Yeah. Do you want to try it? No. <laughs> oh, dang it. 
<laughs> Dang. Because I don't know who's listening. <laughs> and they're going to say, no, historians don't do that. You know? I'm sorry. Okay. So no, my students always ask questions like, this, well, what if? And that's, I think what if is interesting. Um, what if is where the fiction writers come in, it right? Is. Oh, it really nice. is. Like well, that's where you read someone who's written a very interesting story of what if Germany won World War II? Then oh, you have right. the man in the high tower. You know, you right. have these these stories that are is, very imaginative. Yeah. Is that a book, The Man in the High Tower? That's a show, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. never heard of it. If it's if if the Nazis and and Japanese had won the World War Two, right? Yep. Yeah. And wow. if they then they invaded America and yeah. they established. Uh, watched it they established their rule or their laws in america then what would that look like is this yeah. a popular tv show i think so but i haven't watched it the, the rock i've I watched a little bit of it service and, i guess yeah i've watched a little bit of it and since i don't get into that sort of thing it's you know i just ah, i don't want to watch this that makes yeah. sense. but i mean that was the goal yeah. germany and japan wow they're um the japanese said uh that they were going to dictate the terms of peace from the white house Oh, that's so creepy. yeah, so the goal was for the Germans to come from the West, uh, so, sorry, to to come from Europe through South America. The Japanese were going to come through Asia to South America. They were going to meet up there, and they were going to invade the United States um, from there. When you say um, redefine the terms of peace, what does that mean? Like what? No, were their they were going to they were going to dictate the terms of oh. peace uh, from ending the war from the White House. Okay. So they were going to conquer the United States, and then they were going to. That's where the the peace terms were going Establish. to be established. Yeah, peace, yeah. peace in their yeah. terms. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. Mm. But we're getting into World War II. That's another subject. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, that's no, another no, that's okay. ten. Podcasts. So I don't I don't know the answer to your question, um, but I do know that Henry Ford had a lot of influence in the United States. Yeah. And there was significant anti-Semitism in the United States as well. It was as well. It that. wasn't just a European thing. Mm. And so one of the things that. Um, we see during the 1930s leading up to World War II and then during World War II was that um, as Jews were trying to escape Germany and actually the German government's um, uh, policy prior to about 1939 was to get Jews to leave Germany mm -hmm. and um, America let very few of them in. That's Yeah, yeah. I have read that. I didn't it's know very that. Sad. They yeah. actually turned ships away. Yeah. So where did they go? That actually, there was, so the St. Louis was a mm -hmm. ship that had left Hamburg, Germany, sailed for Cuba. And when it got there, the Cuban government, although people had paperwork and everything, and um, they were supposed to be led into Cuba, the Cuban government refused them. No. And they sailed back up the, the Atlantic coast of the United States, radioing um, officials in the United States government. Mm -hmm. And the United States refused the ship. The ship returned to Europe, and many of the people on the ship died in the Holocaust. That is horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. More people than just, you can't just blame Germans. Oh, right. There were yeah, many, many people who that. were, who, who had guilt or had blood on their hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How scary. Like, I'm sure the person in charge of saying, no, you're not allowed in here was like, well, it's not my fault. I was just following orders. And like, I don't know, this is kind of off topic, but how many times a day do people do that? Like, oh, I don't need to think about this. Somebody told me to do it and it might be the wrong thing to do, but like, mm. I, I was told not to do the right mm -hmm. thing. So it's not my fault. That's sure. right. Yep. Sure. We wash our hands. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like we could talk about this forever, but <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question. I don't think it's a short answer, but do your best. Okay. Um, I know that historians will often bookend decades, or at least when we study that in school, you're, you're studying them by a decade. We like these neat, you know, chapter beginnings yeah. and ends. If you had to bookmark the decade of the twenties with something that started it and something that ended it ending would probably be the stock market crash i would imagine mm -hmm. but what would you say would be sort of those bookend events yeah i think i always back the 1920s up to about 1918 1919 to mm -hmm. the end of world war one mm -hmm. because so much changed from america came out of world war one the richest and most powerful nation on the face of the earth wow and that was it had been moving in that direction since the 1898 war with uh, spain but um, mm. I would say that because so much changed um, and out of that came the Red Scare of the early 1920s and the conservative reaction to that. Um, and I would say, too, I think the other bookend certainly is uh, the administration of Herbert Hoover 
and the um, and the stock market crash of yeah. 1929, when things really changed very dramatically. The 30s looked very different oh. from the 1920s. Yeah. Um, and uh, what's interesting, too, is that you have in the 1920s, you have Republican presidents. Uh, so Woodrow Wilson uh, was president until uh, 1921. And incapacitated, interestingly, for about the last 17 months or so of his administration. And then and you not have... super popular during World War One, or at least in the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, he was his goal was to bring peace to the world. He yeah. truly believed that he could bring lasting peace to the world. Mm -hmm. And so one of his goals was uh, one of his 14 points was to um, have the world join the nations of the world join a, an organization called the League of Nations, mm -hmm. and he believed that if nations joined the League of Nations, then war would be no more mm -hmm. because nations would be able to sit across the table from one another and talk about their differences. I mean, it's very he was very idealistic. He was. So I'd say that was after that you have three Republican presidents: Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have all this conservative decade of the 1920s, and you have a total shift because of a crisis, the, 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 the economic crisis of the 1930s, and you have 12 years of one Democratic president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, you know, we could talk about Ugh. forever um, because Definitely of his shaped. influence. You know, today we still feel his influence and the yeah. reforms of the, of the New Deal. Yeah. on our society. So I'd say those two things. I think World War One, I'd start the 1920s really with the end of World War One and go through 1929 or so. Okay. Do you have, or I should say, can you recommend any good movies or books that accurately represent that period of time? The 1920s? Maybe for the non-academic, for the lay person that we could... Yes, maybe for somebody who doesn't know how to, what's going on. <laughs> I can't. No, Jeff, no! <laughs> All right. Well, this is a great. This is a great talk. Can you like Thanks. off camera? Let's not end there. <laughs> Can you off camera recommend some, or is it like? No, I just, I just don't know of many that I would recommend. Okay. I actually have one book that okay. I read a couple years ago by Bill Bryson called, uh, I think it was called One Summer, and it's the summer of 1927, and it's just this fun book about everything that happened in kind of the world, but mainly in America or related to people who were in America in one summer. And it's just like this crazy snapshot of kind of almost right in the middle of the 1920s. And it's all across the gamut. It's really a fun, hmm, a fun book. Is it historical fiction or is it? Nope. It's nonfiction. Oh yeah. Written by a, a journalist and a guy who has a pretty good sense of humor. So it's, it's a fun read. Have you hmm. heard of that one? No, no. It's not like a serious academic book, but you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of lots of academic books about the 1920s, um, but you, I think you asked about films, and I just, yeah, that's. Well, even books like for somebody who wants to learn more about this but doesn't want to sit down with a textbook, mm -hmm. do you have any, anything like that? Um, uh, I there's a book about Charles Lindbergh that's really quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Lindbergh was one of the heroes mm -hmm. of the well for a while. Then he became an opponent to the war. Yeah. Uh, but he has an interesting life story, I think mm -hmm. that, um, and and I think too, anything uh, interesting about the, the Scopes Monkey trial and that, you know, just the culture, there's a really old book called um, Only Yesterday. Okay. And it's about the, uh, the about the 1930s. Yesterday. It's about, it's by Frederick Lewis Allen. And he just, he wrote it, um, kind of in the moment soon mm -hmm. after the 1920s. And he talked about all this cultural stuff of the 1920s. Yeah. Now, the thing about it is he really emphasizes the unusual mm -hmm. and um, he's he's not a scholar. Um, and so I, you know, you kind of have to take everything he says with a grain of salt, but it, sure. it's kind of interesting to okay. read from yeah. someone who was really closer to the time. Yeah. I gasped because there's this movie called Only Yesterday, but it's not Oh, it's, it's not, not really, about the nineteen twenties. Uh, no, not quite. Okay, <laughs> it's an anime. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would certainly be interested to know: is humans are predictable, right? In many ways, we um, tend to repeat the same patterns for better or for worse. So, as a as an historian, can you look back through the lens of at least American history and world history in the ways that it that it's related, and see? a cycle of patterns that we maybe repeat some of the same kinds of behaviors 
over and over. Yeah. So I always like to say that history never exactly repeats itself because mm -hmm. some people say history repeats itself. I think someone has said that history rhymes and I, I believe huh. that, you know, so there are, there are threads that we could connect from time, from time to time. And so, you know, you can look at this desire of people to feel comforted in the past, to look mm -hmm. at, look to the past and say, that was better than it is now. We, we tend to do that, right? We yeah. tend to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say, oh, the 1950s, if we could only go back to the 1950s. But then we forget that the 1950s was not a great time for a lot of people. It was right. a time of extreme racism. Yes. It was a time of, um, you know, the being scared that we were going to be annihilated by the Soviet Union yeah. and that, you know, there was going to be nuclear war and all this sort of thing. So I think that uh, we, we do tend to romanticize the past yeah. a lot. And, um, but I, and I also think too, you know, you, you can see human beings are human beings. Mm -hmm. um, culture changes, but human beings do not change. Uh, you know, human nature does not change. Right. We're still, we cry like the people in ancient Rome cried. You know, we, we're selfish like the people in ancient Greece were. We are, Stubborn. You, stu you know, all of those things. It's just the culture, the human made part of the environment that mm -hmm. changes. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we're human beings are going to respond in very similar ways as people did 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 375 years ago, because human beings really don't, human nature doesn't change. Yeah. That's so pretty to think about. Like you said, um, it was just a second ago, we cry the same way that people did in ancient Rome or ancient Greece. And it's like, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I, love yeah, I mean, humans are humans, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's this, um, there's, there's just a, there's a comfort in knowing that as well, because we can learn lessons from the past. Yeah. I think we have to be careful about what we call lessons, because as I said a, mo a moment ago, um, history never exactly repeats itself, but there are lessons that can be learned. And if we don't learn the lessons of the past, I mean, we are created with an ability to remember. Yeah. And so there must be a reason for that, right? Yes. Not just so I can remember the alphabet, mm -hmm. but so that I can learn from the past. Yeah. And so that maybe the maybe the present and the future can be a little bit better yeah. than the past was. Yeah. And I think that's the gift that historians and teachers of history bring to the rest of us is that you carry those stories from the past into the present time. Mm -hmm. And it, it is always good for us to learn and know about what came before the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. So sure. yeah, we sure. really appreciate you coming <laughs> on here. You're welcome. <laughs>